For quite a while, I have been thinking about sharing a show on my art over the course of 50 years, a little bit more even. And so I'm finally uploading this to YouTube so you can see it. And someday I'll have my art page configured and you can buy it as well. But that's not yet in the cards. So this is... I have some older pieces somewhere, but this is what I have scanned. And I was about 12, maybe 11, when I painted this. We had watercolors in the house. There was crayons and there were watercolors. So this is watercolor. And I'm doing a little artsy stuff there in the background. This one is also watercolor that I just laid on really thick. It almost looks sometimes like gouache or something. But this is obviously during my enchantment with ancient Egypt, which went on for years and years. Around this time, I was trying to learn hieroglyphics and memorizing the dynasties and just really deep, deep into adoring ancient Egypt. And we have this obviously cracked and half destroyed statue with <laughs> Isis whispering into her ear. I don't know if that was intentional. I was just filling all available space, I think. And then uh, after I left college, this is one of the many ink pen drawings that I did enhanced by colored pencils. And these are just straight out of my head that, you know, just no particular intention or purpose, but just kind of visionary, envisioning energy flows, states of transformation and dreaming and trance dance calling up spirit beings in this picture this is based on loosely on west africa somewhere and this is done with oil pastels so it's a lot rougher uh, most of what you're going to see here is much sharper but these are a rougher style most of the art i was doing in the early 70s even before that was just pen so it would be a felt tip pen or it'd even be a ballpoint pen and this was part of a series of comic books that i commenced and the early ones never got finished. I have those, they'll be in a different show on, on graphic design that I'll upload later. But this is about uh, a matricultural view of imperial conquest, war, and patriarchy, and how far away it gets from the natural world, the real reality. And along the same lines, this one was done several years later, where just the industrial extraction, destruction uh, underneath there and reclaiming the earth in the name of life principle. This is one that you could see here what, what's happening is a lot of times with these, this is just ballpoint pen drawing. I would put the pen down and it would keep moving and I wouldn't lift it off the page. So look, especially if you look on her body, there's whole lines here that are continuous going on for quite a while. And that, that was the style that I was really using at that time. And so this again, transformational experience, states of, of uh, trance and meditation and spirit journey. This went into a, an early collection of prints that was published by the Women's Press Collective in Oakland in somewhere in the early 70s. Invocation, there's a lot of art along those lines. This is a combination of pen and colored pencils. Doing a lot of monochrome in those days. And again, the, the, the energy fields and the movement happening there. This, I believe, was pencil drawing down the moon. And I was beginning to read, as you can tell from the title, uh, Wiccan uh, writings. And this is actually a principle that goes back to the ancient Greeks, but an idea of what witches did. But in, in the early pagan movement in the mid 20th century, it gets revived, Doreen Valiente and, and others begin to use that phrase again. And this one also, I was reading a lot about astral projection and kind of rolling out of your body in an exalted state. And the, these, again, the transformations, a little bit of Kundalini energies going on there. And, and the body almost like a shell that spirit emerges out of, but actually is inhabited by spirit. 
and more ballpoint pen with a little bit of acrylic on there. But just that movement and that energy charge that comes from ecstatic dance. And I was doing a lot of that at that time and going through huge changes, realizations, uh, growth, internal growth as a result of that. So I was into tarot and I started a tarot deck. Didn't get very far because I really was very, I was moving around a lot. I didn't have any real income. The thought of having to invest all this energy in 78 drawings and then have no way to get them printed. I just said, ah, fuck it. <laughs> so it just, uh, this one here is again, those line drawings. And you can see that the magician card number arcana one in the tarot deck replaced by the witch positive sense, you know, rec reclaiming this word of witch. And these, images right here are again that Wiccan influence. So you've got the, the dagger, the wand, the cup, and the pentacle. And this was drawn as uh, the 14th arcana, which is called temperance. Uh, originally in black and white pen, and then I painted it in. And so the idea of both of temperance in the sense of water and fire merging and making something new in the form of steam, but also the intense need to balance, to keep forces in balance. And so there's this huge concentration and intensity of that, but she's holding it. She's she's keeping it stable, something we need to learn now. <laughs> uh, Dakinis, I was reading a lot about Tibetan tradition. And again, the ecstatic dance, these, these are modeled loosely on the, the kind of dance that you'll see uh, Dakini's doing in Tibetan art, not the headdresses. This is all just kind of jamming, kind of like jazz. Um, the solar disc here in the, min in the middle, but lots of joy in this. This is another one that began as a ballpoint pen drawing. And then I went back, I don't know, maybe 10 years later and painted her. This has been one of my most popular prints. And you've got it down here in Russian, Vyedma Baba, Old Witch, which is in, in modern Russia is considered one of the worst things you can call a woman, really contemptuous name for an old woman, or maybe even not an old woman. But uh, at the time, I was really trying to reclaim the Slavic, the, the Dvoya Vyeria, or even the Staraya Vyera, the, the old faith or the double faith of the peasantry that had kept these deep nature philosophies, uh, ceremonies, observances. And so that's what I had in mind when I, when I did this. But then I kept having, you know, selling prints of this, Jewish women would come up and say, that's my booby. And so there was a whole other side to this, you know, and a lot of times the painting can be more than what you meant or intended because it strikes a chord in different ways. And that happened with a couple of the pieces. In fact, back here, the, the temperance image, that, that happened, uh, an African-American woman in Chicago said, that's me. And I looked up at her and it sure was, <laughs> you know, it just looked just like her. So um, that happens. But I was trying in, in engaged in really tracking ancestral European tradition, especially at this time in the in the mid 70s, the Celtic. And so here is the Celtic calendar. And you have the cross quarters that are really featured prominently here. And then, you know, they're between actually the solstices and the equinoxes. So this is more pen and ink. Another one in crepas or even crayons, I'm not sure with this one, uh, mixture of a uh, line drawing that I then colored over. And this is, again, no particular place or culture. I was just playing around with the moon reflected in the water there. And then this one, I think I had just moved to Washington. I was living in a basement in Seattle in the winter. So that pretty much finished Seattle for me. The sun would go down at 3.30 and I was getting up at 11. So, <laughs> but uh, calling in. So sacred dance, this just, this is a a lot of the art I was doing, this is really about my emotional process and dreaming and um, just seeing that, that potency flowing. 
all entirely just with one Sharpie. And again, the line, there's like the lines go on and on and on. I just whooped it out. This drawing probably took me less than half an hour to, to put together. But the energy fields here, and I'm epileptic, so you see the spike and dome pattern showing up sometimes in the energy fields that I'm, you know, my my neurodivergent hand is drawing. And and here's actually uh, the experience of a seizure, and so the explosion and being partly on fire, running but can't escape. You go down. Vanco overcoming, more trance dancing, lots of energy flow happening there. You know, through dance, a lot of things get released and you become conscious of memories a lot of times that just come up in, in the process of, of moving your muscles and your blood pumping. And, you know, uh, transformative understandings can enter in in those states. Took me a while to get away from the oil pastels. It wasn't really my medium, but I had fun with it. This was painted, which was a lot of work to paint writing, but I was living uh, way out in uh, the foothills of the Cascades. And the, what this really was about was reclaiming the dark because of all the, the negativity towards black magic and you know black thoughts and black male and all these metaphors in Euro culture and really a legacy of the diabolism of the witch hunts and the demonization of blackness. And so there's a whole list here of the Mongolian black faith and different different instances where the dark was revered. And so this was just kind of a meditation on that. And this one as well. This is actually a page from my Witch Dream comics, which I'm gonna show you. I don't know if it's coming up uh, here. I, mean, I might have it in the other show. But uh, again, uh, I was in my Central Asian period, some of the imagery here, and the Turkic culture, which is also here. So there were, I go to the city dump and there's this canvas tent and I, did, I couldn't afford canvas stretchers or any of that stuff. And it was like, oh, here's canvas. So I took the parts that weren't moldy and cut them off and I had a couple pieces I could paint on. And so this was one of them. And it was really about Amazon traditions out of Central Asia that uh, uh, various ones from, from Turkic uh, traditions. And so I painted that. And this is a lot like the land that I was in, in, in the uh, foothills of the Cascades at that time. And so this painting ended up being the cover for one of the earliest women's music records that was pressed by High Risk, which was a lesbian funk band out of L.A., and so they made that the cover and Bobby Jackson, who we remember in, in reverence, now an ancestor, bought the painting. I don't know whatever happened to it, but maybe her relatives have it. I don't know. So that's the, here's another piece of the canvas that I retrieved. And this is called World Tree. And this, again, is back into the Siberian shamanic worldview the tree of life on the mountain at the center of the world. And you have the, the darkness in the moon, the waters of death, the sun, the waters of life. And then I've got these seven spheres here that she's ascended all the way to the top. The woman is dancing there. And so this is like informed partly by idea of chakras, but you know, in North Asian tradition, there can be seven planes or there can be nine planes so there's a number that varies by traditions but i put a kundalini serpent here coiled at the very base of the roots and then also i have a lot from the siberian period i wasn't doing I, as much history uh writing at that time as i was doing art and in doing slideshows to talk there were these amazing poems these long poems called olonjo in Saha or uh, Yakutia is the part of North Asia where they live. And they have this old goddess called Ayuhit, who is the Milk Lake mother. She's there with the fount of the waters of life. And these waters are actually formed of dews that foam that comes showering down from the tree and digs into the earth 
and a, of pure milk formed a lake, it says. So there's this idea of life essence that's just pouring forth everywhere from this central font. And she's under this tree of life where she inscribes the fates of all living beings on its leaves. So I just was so grabbed by that. And these traditions are amazing, but there's no, I've never been able to find any illustrations of them. So this was my attempt to envision those cultural worlds. And you have the uh, fur mosaics that are very common in uh, North Asian um, women put together uh, fur art in clothing. I had returned to Berkeley briefly, and this was drawn in 1976. I was living in another of the collective lesbian households there. And this is based, this, this shield pattern that she's holding is based on uh, tattoos from Kalimantan. And the general dress and everything here is the, the uh, ba based on that region of uh, Eastern Indonesia, Malaysia. Also, this one, this is maybe the, my last of the crepas period, the, the oil pastels and trance dance. This is actually me uh, doing ecstatic dance and really focusing here on the lower dantian and all the energies coming out of that core of the lower body. But you'll see also with the purple, it's coming out from the third eye and kind of swimming in these energies and almost flying as if she was in water you know, no gravity visible in this. And this just kind of spun out. I started with her head and the rest of the body just followed. Kadesha means the holy woman and both the Canaanites and the Judeans had uh, priestess figures like this. And again, envisioning something because I was reading about these, these Kadeshot, but not, not any illustrations and later i did find some so she has the hand drum the frame drum in her hand because this is something that is um really wide widespread throughout the southwest asian cultures also her whole appearance the headdress all these these images here are based on the nimrud ivories which were made by phoenician or syrian artists who had been taken into captivity in the assyrian empire so they're one of the great sources for us visually on what this uh what these cultures look like what their priestesses look like or their their deities and then there was i found a tradition that timbuktu the name timbuktu means place of buktu and there's a legend about a woman named buktu who was the founder of this city and this is one of the great centers of the sahelian civilization and i was rendering the uh plaster not work the various patterns that were uh, mostly molded onto the walls of the houses. These are typical styles that you'll see going all the way from Mauritania across into uh, Central Africa. This is my favorite part, and I have to get this. Uh, I have to scan the slide because I could. I want to give you a blow up of that, but this is not real high res enough to do that. This is one of the first pieces that I did on a window shade. I kind of just really like the texture of it, kind of parchmenty or something. And uh, this was a study of African architecture because at this time in the 70s, I was reading a lot of sources about African history and trying to recover some memory of this this huge, very ancient history in Africa. And, you know, the the claim being consciously or unconsciously transmitted in Euro education, though there was not really any African arch architecture, any civilization to speak of. And so this is all just done geographically. So you have these huge halls in Central Africa, the Bantu speaking cultures and the Mapungubwe and Great Zimbabwe down in the Southeastern part. And that's a megalithic monuments in here. I included a uh, Arabia, because it really is, you know, part of Afro-Asia. And here's Hatshepsut's great uh, temple tomb at Deir al-Bahri and the megalithic monuments in the Sahara and the towers of Morocco and Mauritania and, and so on and so forth. So it was a meditation, just kind of 
trying to put that together. This began as a pencil drawing on what I tried made into a diazo print and then painted. This is when I really began starting to use acrylics was in the very early 80s. And this is a story about a python healer in the Shona tradition who heals her father, the king. And he has said, whoever cures him will be the next ruler. And so she becomes the first of the queens and allowing this python to coil around her. And the python gives her this moonstone that's then passed down through the uh, generations of the Buhera clan amongst the women. A lot, of, a lot of the art I was doing this period was to pull forward a visualization of what important oral stories that I could find, uh, women, leading women. And the Soroko people in Mali had a story about Pasini Jobu. And she was the greatest healer, the greatest medicine woman, the Tungutu. And this is a scene where she is trance dancing for three days and transforms herself into a great bird and is able to bring back to life this dead ram that was a favorite of the kings. It was probably somehow the energy of the kingdom was invested in that ram. And so she actually had the power to bring back from the dead in this tradition. In China, that was a hard dig at first because I was just finding patriarchy all the way down for the longest period. But then I found out about the Wu. And these were priestesses, female shamans in ancient China. Quite a quite an extensive tradition. And so the, actually the character that's on her, her uh, robes, which in retrospect, this is more of a Japanese style, this circle <laughs> than Chinese, but uh, the golden robes are very much part of the, the realm of the sacred in China. And so she's dancing and there are one of these jade uh, pieces. They, they had jade chimes that they would use as well as gongs, iron, uh, bronze gongs. So more ecstatic dancing. And I'm still, I'm still drawing. I mean, some of the art that I did, I would just sit down and draw. There was no meaning or purpose to it. I was just, except that the elevation of, in this case, female boldness, spirit, courage, the whole re-envisualization of women's experience. And, you know, so the lives of countless mothers here in, somewhere in medieval Europe this is more playful, a uh, fairy woman dressed in medieval style. Banshee, I was, the banshees were going on at that time. That This is really a lot of my art comes from when I was in school, high school, all the way through. I would sit and doodle while, you know, they were teaching whatever. I can remember better actually that way. But this is this is the cover of one of my notebooks where I was you know, had a lot of notebooks. I was writing down everything in those days. It was still very expensive to photocopy things, which caused me to miss a lot of text that I would love to have now, but I was taking notes for everything. And then in the early 80s, I did a set of, of note cards. So I actually had these lithographically printed. And this was one about the solstice, the dark of the year. And then years later, I did this one. And this is based on the Scandinavian societies, the classic uh, dragon beam there at the top of the house. But just the swing of the heavens moving above. And then a series of cards called Celtic Callens. And so that began with Samhain, uh, Summer's End in, in Irish, but All Hell's Eve to those in the English-speaking world. And so you've got, um, you probably recognize this from Newgrange. I've got the hazelnuts here because hazelnut divinations were something that were a thing in uh, folk culture, Celtic folk, folk culture. And so here, Emolk, which is the Fe Feast of Lights, the eve, the night of February the 1st, coming on to February the 2nd. And singers would go from door to door and mummers carrying the brichok, the little doll of Brija, whose holiday this is. And she has everything to do with fire and lights. In fact, there's a cradle here with her. And then also the, the Bridget's cross there 
uh, made it out of plate, plated rushes in the backgrounds. Then Bielchen in May Eve, dancing around the May tree, which is hung with garlands and the ecstatic ring dances were something that the clergy tried to stamp out and could not because they were beloved. Lesser known holiday, Lunasat or Lamas in the beginning of August. And so loaf mass, the baking of loaves because the harvest is starting to come in. And another card was, uh, this is the Scottish form, Kaliach Beir, with her slachton, the staff, the, the wooden staff that she would use in her power as winter, she would strike her staff at the base of the gorse tree. And then it, this, this energy would remain there during the course of the winter. But she would also use it to strike things sometimes as a destructive force, you know, causing things to freeze. And her, the older form of this, at least as far as what's recorded, is Kaliach Beira in Ireland, the Hag of Beir, the old woman of Beir, who was an ancestor of nations and peoples. And this was a uh, pencil drawing initially, and they later did a washes over it with, I don't know, even must have been watercolor, I guess. But this is not the original color. So I started to enhance things digitally after a while because it could really bring through the detail and I could also get away from black and white but the thing about her is she's exceedingly aged and so her face is almost like wood gnarled with with the the many years that are upon her and another story is from the cycle of Ulster where Maha's husband brags to the king that she can run more swiftly than his favorite horses. And so he forces her to race those horses, but she is pregnant. And the word is happens to be missing right there, but it, <laughs> uh, so she does, she wins the race and then she lies down and uh, you know, the trauma of being having to do this causes her to give birth right away. And she dies cursing the men of the red branch and they are to be weakened forever after with menstrual pains or birth pangs when they go to battle. And so there's this contradiction, the, the, the violence against women uh, very much bouncing back on the men that, that did this to her as a penalty for their undertakings in war. And so she's unbinding there. They're asking her to race. So she's taking off her clothing so it won't get in her way. And this belt is very important. It's not a belt because there's the birthing belt and there's healing belts and there's all these traditions, not only in Ireland, but you know, you have the Moilach belt and other examples that um, the belt is something that was also used in contraception as well as in the birth chamber. And then here is, this is really based on the manuscript style in the Book of Kells, other various Celtic uh, illuminated scriptures of the early Middle Ages. And so um, Brigid, she of the three Donna, the three gifts or the three powers, she's got, she's of healing, so she's got the herb. She's of poetry, so she has the harp, which is sung, the sung poetry. And she has the tongs because she's also the matron of smithcraft. Around her is the fire, the sacred, all ashless fire of Bria and the oak forest at Kildara, which was once her temple and then later on becomes a Catholic convent. This is another note card that was inspired by um, orature that was gathered by Charles Leland from Madalena, a Tuscan witch, and he published this in English as the Gospel of the Witches. So there were a lot of spells and chants in there that were used by the peasantry and you know what to, to say when you're gathering rue and calling on Madonna Ruta, the, the, the lady of the, of the plant. Pencil, envisionment of Freya. I didn't like any of the images of Freya that I found out there. So I just made one of my own. There's a lot of knot work in here, a little bit of mugwort flying out there behind her. But the feather robe was her attribute that allowed her to fly across the lands. And so that was just the main gist of this. And also to affirm large women, because that would have been an aesthetic, 
ascetic in um, uh, Norse culture, valuing ample, amply endowed women. This was my first aqua tint. And the spelling here is based on, at least partly on the Wintone Chronicles, which was in the 1300s before Shakespeare you and, and Macbeth and the, and the, th the three weird sisters. There are the three witches. Uh, he was going on older writings in English, and that was one of them. So anyway, I, I've envisioned them here kind of in the mode of the Greek moire, where you have the spinner, the measurer, and the one who cuts the cord. And also at this time, I'm beginning to write in 1978 to write what became, became my book, which is in Pagans, Women in European Folk Tradition. But at that time, it was covering the whole historical period of, of the, the witches and the witch hunts in Europe. And so um, I was working on art like this because, again, there's very little art that shows exactly what it looked like in the Inquisition's chambers of interrogation. And so, again, trying to envision this, and you can see the strapato there, but, you know, she's being brought before the Dominican judges, the, the merciless tribunals there, and the executioner is also the torturer. So he's standing by ready uh, to coerce and the prisoner here. Um, this is a piece of art that I'll probably never sell because... <laughs> But, it, you know, people don't necessarily want these unpleasant scenes on their walls, but it was important to me to have something to talk, especially about Adexter Panda is the name of a papal bull that uh, Pope Innocent, which I forget, the fourth maybe, uh, promulgated that reintroduced judicial torture as licit. It was approved by the top of the church hierarchy. And this is an old Greek and Roman custom of torturing people in order to get confessions out of them that gets revived with the Inquisition in 1252. In the mid-80s, I was approached by someone who was going to do a circular tarot deck, and it was called Daughters of the Moon. And I did a number of drawings for her. This is one of them on the Pythia. This would have been one of the, the Arcana. I forget which one. And I envisioned the tripod that she was traditionally seated upon as being stone in the more archaic period rather than a bronze, as you see in the, the art. This one was also for Daughters of the Moon, but this is the form of the original drawing that I did and then painted. Uh, initially, that tarot was all black and white, and that's all I did. None of my color went into it and later it got colorized not always to my satisfaction <laughs> but um by someone else and anyway uh i'm very into the ocean goddesses of the mesopotamian cultures sumerian namu babylonian tiamat and so part sea serpent and with the waters pouring forth she's that source cauldron of Caridwen in the Welsh tradition. And one of the translations for Caridwen, at least at that time that I was exploring, was that it meant the white sow. Uh, so a lot of the sources at that period were, were saying that. And since I've found other etymologies, but anyhow, this is, you know, putting her as an old woman and uh, brewing the elixir of immortality. And this was the Eight of Flames, which was the fire suit in the Daughters of Moon Terror burnout. I like that one. And this was the last one I drew of Isis, and it was the High Priestess card. So if you look at the High Priestess card, there are two pillars behind her, and it has been kind of rung through Aleister Crowley and Egyptianizing and, and Hebrew and, and Christian themes. And so you've got the, the Hebrew forms. I think there's Bina. Uh, B and J. I forget what the other one stood for, but um, I wanted to show that the most archaic form of these double period, uh, double, double pillars behind the high priestess in this form, Isis, uh, would have been the Egyptian lotus and papyrus. And so she has the, the Ankh, one of her attributes. She wields the very symbol of life. 
and then the sistrum in the other hand with the head of Hathor. And this is the percussion instrument of the temple women that were shaking the sistrum as they danced and sang the invocations. Behind her is the Nile in flood because this is something that's very much associated with Osset as the star Sirius, which is one of her forms, Saptet, when it rises with the sun, that is the signal that the Nile is about to start to flood. And here comes all the rich black silt from deep in Africa. And these wings are also an attribute of Isis, as is the belt of Isis or the knot of Isis, which you'll often see called the girdle, but that has different association for moderns than it did for the ancients. And then this was not any more for the Daughters of Moon. I really liked working inside a circular space. So I did several more paintings of that. And this one is for Hotel Guohong, the Yellow Land Earth Queen, and a story where she, with her hands, pats out the yellow clay and forms ignorant man. So she's a creator. She's a maker of humans. And this is, this is a different angle on those who were only ever exposed to the Genesis story. And then uh, Gaja Lakshmi means Lakshmi of the elephants. And there's quite a few representations of her like this in modern India, where the elephants are spraying water and kind of like just adoring her. She's seated on a lotus, which is not at all atypical. But what's different here is that a lot of the Lakshmis that we're seeing was pink, like the modern posters of Lakshmi. So I went back to two sources. The dress that she's wearing is really based a great deal on the terracotta plaques of Madura, the Gangetic Plain in North India. But her face and just the whole kind of energy is really also informed by the Ajanta cave paintings, you know, and this sense of like the very ancient form of Lakshmi. Instead of having her pouring out coins, she's pouring out just life essence. And then she has the kumba in her other hand, the sacred pot. This one, I began in 1978. I had this four foot square piece of masonite somebody had given me. And I didn't really like the idea of painting in a square. So I turned it on a corner and it got started. I did some of this early parts here in 1978. And then it sat there for the longest time and I wasn't able to finish it until, as you can see, much later. This is an oil painting. So, you know, I didn't always have space to do oils but this was one. And unfortunately, I don't have, I can't include better close-ups because I have to re-photograph it. It's sitting in my hallway, um, ready to be sold to anyone. At the, this is another view of it actually hanging in my house, a little bit sharper. But I have to take it outside to photograph it because there's not enough uh, angle of view. So this is based, let me go back for a second. This is based not only on geographically, this is the north, the east, um, the west and the south, but also sunrise, midday, sunset, and midnight. So you get the night sky here behind the machi who is drumming on her kultron. And it's meditation on South American archaeology, on the various cultural elements, the pottery and the patterns that were painted on it, bronzes, uh, architecture in the Amazon reason, region. Uh, metates in the form of animals. So life givers of Tamwantin Suyu. And I made a poster on reproductive rights, which began as a painting. I should show you this part first. This is a close-up of the painting. And then I want I needed to typeset it, but I really couldn't afford to have it professionally done. It was only about 1990 that I could actually do the typography myself. And this was about not only abortion rights, but all the reproductive rights for including contraception and uh, maternal rights and including all the kinds of women that had those rights violated on, on a regular basis, as well as the rights of indigenous people to their families. Another Celtic theme, this is Scottish, it's somewhere in the 1100s maybe, calling it the Pictish stone. And this is the Brandbutt stone, one of the my favorites out of these. They were 
naturally shaped stones, sometimes dressed, but sometimes not, that had all kinds of animals and patterns. And you have these often these broken arrows, which may be have to do with them being boundary markers between clans. And so the salmon or the eagle or the snake would have been clan animals, according to that analysis. Well, here's another window shade piece, the Banshee Fountain. And I was using Banshee here in the sense of woman fairy, the literal meaning of the name, and not so much the the caller whose cries omen dire things being about to happen, but just really as the divinities of the land, the fairies of the waters, the streams, the forests, the, you know, all these, these, um, all the animacy of the land. And you can see this burgeoning energy throughout, kind of loosely based on uh, Irish uh, metalwork, the terra brooch or others. La Ten style spirals. And this thing about them combing their hair, the comb shows up on the Pictish stones. And you have stories about a fairy whose comb was stolen uh, by a man who comes along. Oh, here's the, the mirror is also based on both England and Ireland had these mirrors with these same patterns that you're seeing here. But the combing of the hair in this case, and all the way over into Russia, the combing of the fairy woman's hair brings rain. So there's that water spare element to it. And with the Norns, once again, uh, no known representations. So I did this visualization of them sitting under, this was supposed to be a pun, the Rowan tree, the rune tree. Now they actually do in, inscribe the runes on, on the... Uh, wood of the tree, according to the Vurvespa in Iceland. But it uh, turned out that uh, later on, it seemed that it wasn't a rowan tree after all, that it was an ash. So we learn things as we go along. But this is a passage from the uh, Vurvespa, and it also has the same concept as the Siberians of dews falling from the tree of life and showering down into the well of Urth, in this case. Here's Urth as a spinner. Bravandi, suckling the serpent. This was a very common way of representing earth around the year 800 or thereabouts. And scold the maiden with her raven staff, uh, touching the runes that they have inscribed on the great tree. I did a number of these, these trees, and this is really a word tree. It's an etymological tree, and you've got uh, relationships. I'm not going to explain all of this, but... Um, you know, eventually these these words, weird, originally means destiny in Old English. You know, there's older meanings here that really have to do with the fate herself. But a weirding women are witches. Weird could be also an apparition of an ancestral being. Uh, weird wife, weird tales, weirding peas, casting lots. Lots of different meanings. And this one too, it starts out etymologically with all the related terms that give rise to these names of the Norns, but then it kind of goes off more into concepts. So you've got the weird stuff here, but we've also got fairy names and various names, uh, you know, Melusine, Morgan Le Fay, um, also the, the Irish names for the fairy in this Shia word, which means mound folk, which we also see in Norwegian. Uh, the fairy godmothers is a whole lot of different, the hags and the, the old goddess, of pagan tradition across Europe, um, Berta of the Winter Nights. So it's just kind of a meditation on this, this matrix of ideas and stories and concepts and, and deities that were current in pagan Europe. And I was just trying to kind of pull this all together and see how they related to each other. Maria Candelaria was a Tzental woman in Chiapas, who started a revolt against the Catholic Church and Spanish colonial rule in 1712. I've got Palenque in the background here because she lived uh, in Cancuc, which is very close to there. And she was uh, struck at by the local priest because she had founded a temple. And the Maya syncretized their old religion with Catholicism. So um, the Virgin Mary was uh, you know, supposed to be officially the recipient of these devotions, but the priesthood knew very well there was more of that 
more going on than that. And so they wanted the temple destroyed and the Tsental re resisted. So they brought in troops from San Cristobal and they destroyed the temple. And because of that, Maria Candelaria unites 35 different Maya tribes and mounts a revolt that goes on for the whole summer. And then they're defeated, of course, because they don't have guns and the Spanish army does. And so, but they never capture her. She just fades back into the mountains. Uh, rewards were of no use. People were united behind her. They couldn't catch her. Here's one about Puerto Rico. And a friend of mine who's a Puerto Rican conga drummer, uh, this is one of two drums I painted for her at different times. And so, Ache Boricua, Ache being an African world word, but you've got this fusion of Taino and African culture, and to some extent, Spanish culture in the islands of the Caribbean. But these patterns here are based on older art that you can see in the ceramics that have survived out of the Taino culture, some of the stone carvings as well. And this was another piece of wood I just painted. I was uh, staying out on this land in Eastern Arizona. Uh, and so the directions, and in some ways there's a similarity with the moon, sun, the, the polarities, the hand and foot that were part of the painting of Ayichit. Unfortunately, this is the only picture I have of this painting. I don't know whatever happened to it. Maybe destroyed sitting out on the land. It might not have ever been indoors. Uh, rune drum. Runa means mystery in Germanic. And this is, again, just kind of a fusion of the wild woman with her drum. And then if you get a close-up of the drum, we have Russian patterns. These are from pagan silver that was from like the 1300s in Eastern Russia at Old Ryazan, the, the Old Ryazan horde. And these are Pictish symbols. There's your broken arrow again. And then the whole other rest of this, the, the pattern here at the center and at the corners is uh, based on Sami patterns. So it's just kind of like a whole North, North European swath there. Pencil drawing based on a corn chant. This became a magnet eventually. I had a, a diazo drawing that I did and then I was making magnets. So the holiday customs of the women in Scotland. Another old woman, Bellezza Orsini. This was from uh, inquisitorial trials in around 1540 in Italy. And she was telling them that she cured with flower oils. She would cure, the, they would take olive oil and leaves and flowers and cure them until they had been infused. And she was a very famous healer. She was very well reputed and that came to the attention of the Inquisition and she was jailed and tortured. And they wanted her to say that she was a slave of the devil and she was resisting and it was awful. And she finally committed suicide in prison. But, you know, really just, uh, very powerful soul. She's Polnitsa, uh, uh, Western Slavs, I forget what, this might be Wendish, um, the spirit of the fields, who uh, sometimes appears to people while they're working out in the hot sun at midday, and they faint, and they have visions of the Polnitsa. This never really got finished, beginning of a drawing, uh, me envisioning older Times, older cultural ways now lost to us. Processions. Lesbian art. This one's also somewhere in the late 70s, I would say. Could have been the early 80s. I didn't put dates on anything. And an art show that I did at Ollie's in Oakland. I really, I had had very few art shows. This was probably the the biggest one that I did. Um, my sister there playing the boron for the opening. Then I got Lyme disease in 1990. And this was a dream that I had because I was really, I was really knocked out neurologically by it. It didn't help my epilepsy any. And after a series of 
traumatic seizures, I had this dream and I was going through this dark tunnel and I saw something glinting on the ground and just a little further along ahead. And so I picked it up and it was uh, an ivory carving of Guan Yin that was inlaid with mother of pearl. And so when I woke up, I decided I was going to paint this and bring as much of that healing energy through because in the dream, I knew that it was, I realized that I was going to recover, you know, and it took a long time, but it was like this ray of hope. And I wasn't really particularly into Guan Yin, but that's how it came about. So in the painting, I show this mother of pearl essence flowing into the receptive hand as I hold her. And then she was really crowned like this. There were these surging energies around her, like waters bubbling up. This is another healing one from very close to that period. And I later found out that there's a Taoist tradition of like the waters here and the fire here and the interplay between them is like an important part of Taoist meditation and Nadan. But this was just based on my own body, my own attempt to, you know, rebalance and same there. <laughs> this was on the beach somewhere in Northern California, just sculpting the sand. And then I'd put shells in here to make stones and shells for the eyes and a nose ring there, teeth, and then hair out of the grass, the sea grasses. The wisdom scroll got started. You can see there it took a couple years to paint. This was another window shade operation. And that's the whole scroll. I'm going to show you uh, close-ups of each of the panels, six wisdom goddesses from different parts of the world. So it begins with Ma'a. And this is a story about how the sun bursts out of the primal egg according to the power of Ma'a. And all the, the living beings take form according to her law so we have serpents and fish and lions of the winged cattle all these beings and there's also the crocodile there in the waters but these symbols here of the ostrich feather have to do with ma and this here with eternity hochma is the second one the principle of wisdom which turns up in various parts of the hebrew bible and these, this most of the imagery here is based on Proverbs. She's a tree of life to all who lay hold of her. And she also, uh, the wisdom buildeth for herself a temple of seven pillars. So actually the tree merges with the central pillar on this temple. And then the idea of Chochmah as, um, is kind of merging also with Shekhinah, that wasn't a concept that existed at the time of the, the Bible wrote was written, at least not as a noun in the in the written Bible, but uh, the hovering, the, the the beating of the wings, the hovering of the divine essence uh, is something that does appear there. And in fact, the related word to Shekhinah Mishkan means an altar, a, a dwelling place. You could translate it. The figures on these sides are based on some of the Nimrud ivories and their actual uh, winged women like this. But here they are uh, guardians of this, or revering, or or in some way um, paying tribute to the, the tree of life there. Kali Mahavidya is the great wisdom Kali. There's a tradition of 10 great wisdoms of which Kali is the greatest. And you have the principles both of creation and destruction in her she's seated in the cave of the heart she's wielding her curved knife and also she has her fire that burns away all impurities all pain her trident this is the kali yantra there below and originally i had painted her like uh kali badra the it's a name for her it means the auspicious kali with her tongue lolling you know, it's more of a wrathful form. And then I decided, I, I I thought about it for a long time. I didn't really want to repaint it, but I decided I wanted to show the compassionate nature more visibly, especially because of the demonization of blackness in uh, Euro-American culture. 
Then came Spider Grandmother and the Corn Sisters. So you have uh, the Corn Sister re emerging here from Sipapu, from the center, uh, the womb of Earth, and coming up ground. And the these together, the Corn Sisters and Spider Grandmother are um, in vivifying the little clay images of all the animals and the seeds of all plants that will be and they sing the creation song over them spider grandmother having covered them with with her film of web and she's here spinning the entire cosmos with her thought some of the names it's anako in laguna means thought woman or you know you see it translated as thinking woman si wang mo uh western queen mother or western grandmother depending on how you want to translate it holding the reishi mushroom, sitting in her realm of the Tianshan Mountains in Central Asia, a wild, a wilderness place, and with the pink and purple clouds of divine essence gathering around her, her servitor, the three-legged frog. Here, the characters from the Zhuangzi, no one knows her beginning and no one knows her end. You can see the... Uh, texture and color of the window shade really clearly here. That's why there's so much tan in some of these paintings. It's the background. The last one here is Italian. Well, the name means, a sapiente Sibilla means the wise Sibyl. And they actually deified the ancient Sibyl of Kumai becomes a, a legendary figure who is kind of made into a witch goddess among the common people in Italy. And there's a place in the mountains uh, a grotto which she is said to dwell upon in and seekers come there looking for her because she and her serpent fairies teach all the magical arts and wisdom so i've shown her here as a serpent woman because she too has the shape-shifting quality and here's the state of transformation right at the center which is also here a womb symbol so that's the wisdom scroll. And this is just kind of, I was just playing around on a piece of canvas I, I found. And it's just kind of just whacked it off. The cedar and the ankh. This was done as a cover for a novel by Martha Shelley. And uh, she ended up not using it, but I had a lot of fun this again, a lot of the imagery here is based on the Nimrud ivories. This was a queen of Israel, the northern kingdom in uh, Samaria uh, in the 900s, 10th century BCE. Much maligned figure who was actually a goddess worshiper from Tyre. And another Jewish figure, Serach, that I did for the woman Shaman DVD, which Oh, it was about 2013. And I created a number of images here because the Makewana, for example, is a very important figure in uh, Southeast Africa, in Malawi. She's the actually the priestess that presides over the pool of Malawi. And this is the abode of the rain python. And there is a succession of Makewana, which means mother of children. So she's the mother of the whole country here wearing her spiral Ndoro amulet. And these this is not a lineage where it's a dynasty, like by birth, but by spirit selection, so that each Makewana is chosen. When the old one dies or retires, then pretty soon a young girl will st or maiden will start showing signs of spirit sickness. And then there will be a series of, of tests that are done to make sure that she's the right one. And then she's installed as the next Makewana. A Cappadocian firewalker. There are Greek writers that talk about women in this region of South Central Turkey walking on fire. So I've envisioned her here as an ecstatic drummer. A lot of this ecstatic ceremony going on in the ceremonies of Kibele and other goddesses of Asia Minor. Utiseta. Also from the Woman Shaman DVD, this is in Norway. Sitting out is the mean, meaning of that name. And this is sitting out on the land for vision, for healing power, for guidance. 
So she's got her staff there and is just looking out across the land and the waters. Now, I showed you this before, but I brought it back just to kind of remind you, because after her trance dance, she rises up. She flies aloft like a bird, and then she settles her wings over the ram and brings it back to life. So this was part of a compositing that I did in, in the, the DVD, in the video. And this one also was from a story, a woman that was called Bear Medicine Woman, who was an important Pawnee healer. And her dreams told her what the healing teepee that she should, you know, that she was going to have, what it should look like with the symbol of the sun and the owl and the cedar tree. And these kinds of altars are very common in the uh, Plains traditions. So the bear medicine is there. La Dama de Cao is one of the early line of Moche priestesses in northern Peru. And this is based on actual mummy of this woman that showed serpents and spiders tattooed on her arms. And she was buried with a whole wealth of regalia, various crowns, these half, uh, these are like suspended from the nose, these half masks, which you see a lot in South America. She had a whole collection of them, very important religious and political leader. Oh, there it is framed. And then this is, I haven't been doing a lot of art, is painting, mostly digital art recently, but this is a piece of wood that I painted um, some years ago of the Queen of Sheba in Aksum. And there's another one, which I haven't finished yet, which is the Queen of Sheba in Yemen, but that has not yet um, been completed, so I can't show it to you. Abatia, this is more of the kind of digital art I've been doing educationally, and this is based on Raphael's painting, which made uh, the the Alexandrian Greek Egyptian woman uh, be a redhead. I didn't really think that was right. I thought at least you know, give her some dark hair. But you know, the the great philosopher, astronomer, and head of the Neoplatonic school, not only in Alexandria, but really that was that was it. That was the deal, in uh, for the whole Hellenic world at that time. I did a series of diazo prints, which are, you know, I draw up in pencil on translucent uh, paper, and then you make blueprints on it. So you can get brown prints also made. So this is a African-American woman who became a literacy leader, uh, escaped from slavery, had learned to read and write uh, even while she was still enslaved. And that became after fighting, you know, uh, working as a nurse, in the Union Army, having escaped from slavery. She later on leads that movement for education. Tierra y Libertad is a slogan of the Mexican Revolution, and this is about the soldaderas, or the women who uh, joined the armies, uh, riding in the freight trains with them to different parts of Mexico. And this is based on, a, these are all based on photos. So I was just drawing these images. This is a little bit more out of my head, but it's based on actual statues, megalithic statues of women riding on water buffaloes in southern Sumatra. And then all the rest of this is Minangkabau in western Sumatra and a matrilineal, matrilocal culture, the Minangkabau people, with their buffalo horned headdresses and their buffalo horn shaped uh, longhouses that they lived in, live in. Um, Finally, just a few, I mean, I, I spoke a little bit about how a lot of the work I've been doing has been digital. And one of it was cutting out by hand all of these, um, you know, by by mouse, I guess I should say, by, by trackpad, all of these images of the ancient female icons from different parts of the world. So this is like a one volume book, in a sense, because it shows all the countries, Sudan, countries you never hear about, Greenland, uh, that make these female figurines and you can see some of the recurring patterns that show up in them so this is my most popular poster uh sacra vulva is another one. Oh, i didn't put in the address here i'll have to uh anyway look for valetta press i have these posters that are available um and then the sacra vulva was 
originally it was going to be one poster, but then I found out there's a whole, there's so many of the vulva petroglyphs that I broke that off. But these are examples of, uh, you know, the tantric worship of the vulva, uh, the Jangawul sisters and creation stories up in, uh, of the Yolnu people up in Arnhem land, a whole variety of vulva iconography from Ecuador and Mexico and Vietnam and Nepal. So put that all together. And then the petroglyphs are here. So there's a separate vulva stones image. And uh, Wyoming, we have a lot of, you know, Thailand, Libya, Mexico, Australia. I won't name all of them, but you get the Bolivia. Uh, because the, this is really one of the most, one of the oldest and most widespread patterns in rock art, if you want to call it that petroglyphs, engravings on stones in the walls of caves and rock shelters. So that was worthy of a women's heritage poster. And then the breast pots, uh, another theme, which are, these are ceremonial pots. They're not used for everyday cooking, but used for to share out uh, liquids perhaps, or pour libations in uh, some kind of ritual context. And again, this is very, very global. And, you know, some unusual, I mean, for example, who knew that they were making breast pots in Germany and something very like that in the Philippines and Peru in Italy. So <laughs> you see these, these patterns and some of them are tripods. Some of them have the breasts going around the sides of the pot. So there's a variation to them. And then the last uh, big size poster I did is prophet, prophetic women. And these are very widespread geographically but women who were either oracles, some of them were actually political leaders who were involved in resistance against colonization, either culturally or by political domination in, in their countries. And then I've also done a series of prints. So a lot of this is collage work uh, to just bring together, like in this case, all the Amazon traditions in different parts of the world. Here's Gulaim of the uh, Karakalpak, Turkic tradition in Central Asia, Kiowa woman warrior. And this is another of these, a collection of some of my favorite images that I just think really need to be better known. You know, that it's really recalling women to cultural memory because there is this blockade of the gatekeepers that just keep us from knowing about this very powerful imagery. So um, this... <laughs> This is probably not the, the address I should have put up. Valetta.net is a better one because if you go to this address, the, the e-com is all screwed up on it. So it's not ready for prime time. But uh, go to Valetta Press and you can find the, uh, the DVDs and the posters. And pretty soon some of the prints will be up as well. And of course, my books, uh, the latest of which is Women in Greek Mythography, Pythias, Melissae, and Pharmakides. So give a visit over there and uh, there are various links on the site to trailers for the DVDs, different things. And that's what I have for you.